This is day six of the July 93 seven day retreat in spring water. Maybe this morning, at least for part of the talk, we will go f freshly again into this question of what am I? In one group meeting, one person said, did I hear you say that I'm not my body? Or that I am my body? And other such questions have come up. So whatever was said yesterday, can we forget about it? I've forgotten about it. We can listen to a tape sometime if we want to dig it up. But contexts change, expressions may change. Our listening at the moment may change. We said in the very beginning that a lot of our listening is very unreliable, as is our speaking. It is There are automatisms involved of wanting to hear things or not wanting to hear things, and then what is said may become distorted. And in speaking, many people have found that when a question is asked, an answer comes so quickly out of a spot in which one hasn't really looked and felt deeply yet. And after having given a, given a quick answer from one's habitual memory channels or reservoirs, One may open up a little and listen and look and realize that wasn't the answer I was going to give or that isn't what I meant or maybe I don't really know, I haven't looked enough. So, what am I? Starting with this body because that gave rise to confusion, whatever I said. See, one can't even begin to start talking what I am without mixing what's there with thought and knowledge and, and memory and imagery. It's all mixed up. There is this body here. And what this body is, this instant, isn't what it was a minute ago or yesterday. That's what one may not necessarily feel all the time, but that is an established fact that there is a regeneration of cells, a dying and a rebuilding of tissue, of organs, of everything. Every seven years we're completely new as far as the organism is concerned, some parts sooner than that. Certainly the fingernails keep growing at an alarming rate. <laughs> one has just cut them and there is one broken already in too long. We talked, maybe in meetings, maybe here, about body image. Because what we know about our body is what we see in the mirror, or looking down here, one sees a good part of it. One doesn't see the head, or the eyes, or the ears, because we can feel them. And also, neurologically, I've read that, very interesting book by a neurologist 
the man that mistook his wife for a hat, <laughs> by Sachs. Many people have read it. Very interesting case histories of neurological dysfunctioning, dysfunctioning disease. And one case, a woman whose body image broke down some kind of a strange disease, made it impossible for the brain to form a body image, meaning this seemingly intuitive, intrinsic knowledge of the body moving, and it is my body that's moving, and how far it reaches. What is also called, this feedback is called proprioception. And with the diseased, with a, with a neurological disease, the woman without body image could not coordinate movements anymore. She couldn't get out of bed. Yeah. Horrendous trauma for her. Only with, because she was a very bright woman, very, a lot of strength and willpower, she established or the brain established a new frame of references which helped her slowly to move again, very cumbersomely. She told Sachs that when she was uh, on her own again to, to get into a bus, people would get very irritated at her, how long it took her, because it was visibly nothing wrong with her. But it took so long to go by these new cues so there is neurologically necessitated a body image. But what does this mind make out of it? We like our body or we dislike our body and that so at different times changing around. I know of people who I find very beautiful, attractive, handsome, they think they're ugly. Not good looking at all. So again, with what is there, actually a distortion takes place in the mind in terms of what I would rather be like, ideal imagery, and also false imagery of oneself. Maybe one has been told all one's life or young life by the parents who were disappointed in one's looks that one isn't as good looking as brother or sister, or at least that one is admonished for one's gait or one's posture, one's expression. My brother was forever told, smile, don't, <laughs> don't run around with a, a German word, as flunch, meaning sort of a mopey face. <laughs> Which meant he felt mopier than before. <laughs> was constantly admonished about his posture, which meant it was sagging more and more. So was I admonished about my posture. Actually, my parents, who were very technological-minded, you know, both scientists, getting sort of tired of constantly admonishing us at the dinner table, from holding the fork right, sitting up straight, not dreaming, made a record. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> and they played that record during many of our meals. <laughs> One of us, I don't know who it was, was admonished to hold the fork right. Fork is the gabel. Gabel is a fork. And one day, the record had a crack. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came to the gabel, it just said, dig up, dig up, dig up. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the end of the record. <laughs> the discipline broke down. <laughs> For all of us. <laughs> So admonished, for instance, about my gait. I was told once that I 
was walking like a wavering barge. <laughs> My sister had a nice walk that was held up to me. Why don't you walk like your sister? All of this impresses itself on the mind and does dirty work. So Sax's body image, which is functioning in those of us, all of us who are not diseased in that respect, is in the mind changed around a lot. Distorted, added to, subtracted from. It may change for some reason when may discover something about oneself which is surprising. One hadn't realized how one looked, actually. So maybe an image is replaced by another one, a better one, more positive one, more beautiful one. And then living by that image. And how, how, do, how do other people see us also with their likes and dislikes. One characteristic may blot out the whole person, a nose or eyes, the, the two big ears or something may blot out the whole picture. It becomes distorted like cartoonists do. They pick out a few salient characteristics of a person's face, and then that's so exaggerated that it becomes funny. And it's not, of course, not the person anymore, not a photographic likeness, and even photographic likenesses we, we often don't like how we look. That's not me, my God. <laughs> Did I look like that? At that particular instant we did. The camera wouldn't have recorded it. And we're aghast or we're enamored with how beautiful we look. Because when we look in the mirror we don't look that beautiful as on that photograph. So am I my body? We include that in our feeling of ourselves attractive or not, aging or not. Maybe if we're aging, we don't see it, or we exaggerate in our minds. But we include in the idea of what we are, this body, with attachments to it, or revulsions about it. Partly resulting from the way we see ourselves in the mirror, but to a large extent how other people have told us they see us or indicate in open or veiled ways how they see us. And then comes this whole thing that we call personality, which is really our habitual ways of responding. Very little of it, after a while, is yet spontaneous. There's so much training and so much approval and disapproval in our uh, ways of talking, acting, responding to each other. It's according to molds, standards, also imagery, to be nice. It's very was trying very hard when I grew up to be nice, nice to everybody, because that was the safest way to be with family and others, to be nice, to be obedient. And that's what I thought I was until once in uh, elementary school, the school principal called me to her office, and she said, I've re received complaints from, the, from your gym teacher that you're bossy to other kids. I was devastated. We had been divided up into groups 
which one of, one of the people in the group was elected by the kids or by the teacher as a leader of that group and they did different things in the gym at the different, uh, what do you call them, instruments there. What do you call it? Well, whatever. And apparently I was felt to be bossy to the kids who were in that group. I had been elected or named a leader. And to this day, I remember the devastation when I was told that this is how I was perceived. And it was a stern reprimand uh, that was given to me with a proverb. Whoever wants to command or give orders first has to learn to take orders, to be obedient. It was also written into my book that you give around to teachers and students for memory of the people uh, write little verse in there or something. This is what the school principal wrote in there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it got to my parents, and they were saying, what are you doing there? I was not aware. Probably was bossy. It didn't fit into how I saw myself at all. I thought I was nice, whatever that means. So we have very little contact with the way we come on to other people. We don't realize it. That takes an extraordinarily sensitive perception, awareness to hear oneself the way one sounds. Because we hear ourselves according to what we think we are nice or friendly, and we may be very abrupt or angry sounding and not hear it. We may talk the way our mothers and fathers talked, or sisters, which we didn't like, but it's, it's been imitated, it's incorporated into the, into the tapes and records and programs, and we don't hear it, we don't see it, we're not aware of it. Most of the time, it's possible, it happens. Suddenly, with increasing sensitivity, one, one hears oneself talk and is amazed. It's not how I thought I sound. So, our habitual personality of trying to please, trying to be nice, or or being aggressive, competitive, ambitious, or shy. All of these characteristics that have evolved since we were the tiniest of kids in relationship with our parents, siblings, teachers, friends, peers. Is that what I am? My habits, my personality? conditioned as it is by conditions in which I grew up. Having to be rough to maintain myself or being coddled because I was the only one. That's part of what I am, is it? The body, the personality. Because all the inherited capacities I have. Gifts, talents, education. With all of that also goes image, doesn't it? One goes to school, one, one is good in a, in a subject because one gets A's and the image arises and grows, I'm good at that, incorporating it into the self-structure and its attachments. Things that one doesn't get good marks in, one assumes I'm not good at, so it also becomes part of the image. I was amazed when I I went to college in this country coming over in, in 51. 
Kyle talked me into going to college. I hadn't been able to do that in Germany. I, I loved it. I loved every bit of it. Everything was interesting. And, and of course, it was part of my image from home, my parents both having been university trained. And my sister was, I wasn't. So now I could add that to my image. I was going to university and I wrote it to everybody at home. It's for them also to complete their image of me. But loving to learn was not just image. There was a real joy in that. Not only learning things, uh, economics and psychology and sociology, anthropology, all of these topics interested me immensely, not only learning, but also unlearning stuff, ideas and superstitions one had held, which were exposed to be just that. I remember one, one young woman who was in, in the first year where we took these basic courses. She's very ambitious, but she failed in almost everything except history, American history. She got an A. She didn't fail, but she got very low marks, too low for her liking. So she said, well, I guess I must be good at that, so that's what I'm going to major in. And I was surprised and astonished on what basis to, to pick what one was going to do on the basis of the marks one got in a course. But I guess this is how it works most of the time. It's also sort of her accepting that other people told her, evaluated for her, and then this was laying out the path for her, what to pursue. It's supposed to be in our teenage years, the, the image crisis or identity crisis, where we don't know what we are, which actually is, is a very healthy state to be in, but it's made out to be a very critical, dangerous time, and as it turns out, maybe just because we think of it like that, rather than giving space to that, comes a lot of floundering around with drugs and alcohol, all kinds of excesses engaged in, because of not knowing what one is. And the pressure to know what one is, to know what one wants to do. Little kids are already asked, what are you going to do when you grow up? <laughs> that pressure is there very early. To make the parents feel safe for their old age to know that the kids are safe, they know what they're doing, they know what they are. One hasn't failed them. So our body, body image, our personality, is that what we are? Our talents, capacities, our education, which may be enormous and ever-growing, adding more and more knowledge, becoming more and more knowledgeable, if that's what we're pursuing. Is that what we are? Or becoming an artist, painter, musician? Is that what we are? The body, the profession. We, we may have no profession. Just do odd jobs. And then what is, what is the image for that? Just earning a living as we go. Nothing nameable or labelable, categorizable. Then what does the self-image look like? 
people here work on staff often say it's very hard to tell people what I'm doing. I, I, sometimes I don't even start to tell them. It's so hard for somebody else to comprehend. So then, does that affect the self-image? Not being able to tell others something that makes an impression. All through the years, staff, people on staff have earned extra money by house cleaning. Or I did it in, when we lived in Rochester. Does that add to one's self-image, being a house cleaner. And how is one looked upon as a house cleaner? Is that what we are? How we label ourselves, our professions, our status in society? We have all kinds of hobbies, things we like to do with so-called free time. Love of, of theater, of movies, of music, playing golf. Is that what we are? I used to be haunted by that question. I remember driving back and forth to Rochester from North Tonawanda to the Zen Center, really trying to get to the bottom of what I am. And obviously, the body always comes first. And I thought, well, what if I lose an arm and a leg? Or all four limbs? Am I still me? And the answer? came, yes, it's still me. Changed, but still me. What about my memories of my family, my brother, whom I love dearly, doesn't live anymore? That's also me. All the memories I have of my past is also me. And my dreams about the future, what, what will happen to me, Imagining it and working toward it, going, driving to the Zen, Zen, Zen center, becoming fully enlightened. That is also me. There, all of this stuff that the mind can pour out so vividly and so realistically because the body hums along with the whole thing. Not just hums, sometimes it's louder than a hum. So the way I think about myself, I image myself, is that what I am? We say we're self-conscious when we get into a group of people. I feel very self-conscious, we say. And with that word, we mean what? Because we could say, well, I feel inferior. I don't know whether I'm up to these people. Maybe they won't accept me. Maybe I'll be awkward. Or maybe I won't be as good a conversationalist as the others. Or maybe I won't be any conversationalist. I'll just be like a bump on a log. <laughs> so self-consciousness, put, put simply, is it this constant stream of thinking revolving around myself. Which creates all the bodily feelings and sensations of fear, shyness, apprehension, or boldness, wanting to impress, aggressiveness.
many of us, maybe most of us, suffer from this self-consciousness, don't we? Which becomes particularly evident and palpable when we enter into a group of people, maybe a new group of people. It's this theme that was picked up by more people than I ever remember anybody, any theme having picked up this fear of people theme we talked about once. A woman coming from a wholesome open walk, seeing the roof of the building and thinking people and something contracting, resisting at the thought of being with people, which is this self-consciousness, isn't it? This whole past and present thinking about myself revolving, moving around in the brain and body. They won't like me. They won't accept me. Others will be shining stars. No one will notice me. Maybe sometimes the thought, I hope no one will notice me. <laughs> hiding the hidden yearning to be noticed. To be loved, to be accepted, to be made feel worthy. Because the revolving thoughts, one of, the, one of those revolving thoughts says, you're unworthy, you're, you're bad, you've done things wrong. I know very well what self-consciousness is. I, I used to suffer from it immensely. At the same time, wanting to be noticed, and at the same time, afraid of being noticed. And all the time, feeling an audience around me, whether it was there or not. Because this brain can also create an imaginary audience of people who judge me, who like me or dislike me or create of the people who are there an imaginary audience. They may be less interested in me than the man in the moon. <laughs> that actually was an insight that occurred very early in my life, and it was a very freeing insight, very momentary and maybe partial, I don't know. I had once been on, on the way home with a girlfriend, we were little girls, walking home from the school. We had been attacked by a bunch of boys with snowballs. <laughs> fired these snowballs at us and we ran home in sheer fright. And also one time on the playground, which was a block down from the house we live, a long block, there were also some boys who had scared us. I don't know, it was my sister and myself. Actually, my sister didn't get scared as easily as I did. It was somebody else I was playing with. And I remember running home that whole block. I, I arrived so exhausted because I was sure all of these little boys were after me. Of course, they didn't seem to be little boys at the time. They were frightful enemies to get me to do something to me. And from then on, I was very afraid as I grew up of meeting boys in the street. And one day, that was the day of the insight, it occurred to me, maybe they don't even notice me. Maybe they're not looking at me or not interested in doing something to me. Maybe I just think that. And I watched them, and I was right. They could care less about me passing by. <coughs> Which took care of a lot of this paranoia about what boys were going to do to me. Feeling a target. And having realized that that was a mistaken thought. And that 
has held up, that held up all these years. To, to be careful with this assumption that someone has it in for me. I may be totally wrong. The other people may be totally involved in something else, not in what I'm doing. But I was talking about self-consciousness and there's also a memory, I've, I've mentioned it once in a, in a talk, I think. We, we, we used to do this walking very similar to here in the Zen center, and our ro robes on and walking there and in the hall. And I was very self-conscious, very self-conscious of my walking, which I felt at the time was very beautiful. I changed my mind <clears throat> about what my sister and mother had said, because <clears throat> now I had hara. <laughs> you know what that is? <laughs> More uh, center of gravity down in the belly, which makes possible a different kind of walking. And when the center of gravity sits between the shoulders or on the head, worrying about one's walking. And then the oppress oppression of feeling <clears throat> feeling audience or performing for an audience the burden of it and wondering whether there could ever be a day in which one could do something without the self consciousness whether it was humanly possible to exist be walk without self consciousness that was the question it went very deep it wasn't soluble at the moment because there was self-consciousness. But today, I can say this is very simple. It's just the thoughts don't revolve around oneself. And for that period of time, however brief or long it may be, the body moves freely. Of course, it has its habitual ways, but it is not oppressed by the thought of audience, either the oppressive or the attractive thought. It's not concerned with that. Those thoughts are quiet, they're in abeyance, they're not full of energy buzzing around like satellites around a planet. So, is it possible, let's put it in a question, for maybe just an instant of a time not to be thinking about oneself, not just on a superficial level, but very deeply, that whole network of thinking is without energy. The energy is here, now, in the trees, in the wind, in physical sensations, and in enormous space and quiet even though the voice is talking and the wind is blowing, there is immense quietness and space. And that's where the energy is. And that energy we have called awareness or attention or insight or hereness or beingness or nowness or such, it doesn't, the word doesn't matter but it is a state of no felt division. Because the thoughts don't circulate around what I am and was and will be. The, the energy doesn't touch that circuit. The awareness is either the circuit breaker or the circuit preventer. It's just here. energizing the body. But what is the body in, in attending to that? Where does it end? Where does the wind stop? There's not, not even need for a body image. Even though reaching out for the microphone, this hand would know where it is, would find it very easily. So some, some knowledge is there. 
about distance and, and coordination. So, what am I? Can I even begin to say, because all that other stuff holds, in a very limited way though. The personality, the background, the inheritance, the upbringing, all of that is very, very limited. There's much more to us than we know or can think about. Because it's everywhere. It doesn't end with the skin of this body or the extent of this memory. It's the plane. Not to be taken literally because we are not airplanes. <laughs> Someone this morning or yesterday said, well, then is it just sensation you're talking about? I don't know what just sensation means. Because I don't know what just sensation means. But I can I can say it's not just sensation, even not quite knowing what that means. Because everything is alive. And the senses are very alive, alert, open, and not separated from each other because thought doesn't say, okay, this is the hearing, but the hearing isn't the seeing, and then there's also the tasting, and then there's the kinesthetic sense. See what thought does? Divide, chop up, fragment. And then we, we believe in that fragmentation because we believe that thought tells us the truth. So can what am I be left forever open as a huge unlimited question mark? also what you are. Just as unlimited, one unlimited being there of human beings, birds, airplanes, houses, trees, deer and fawns. Here today, gone tomorrow. So how, how do we meet each other when we leave what we are open? Question all this categorizing and image making, even though it happens. It can be watched when it happens. Seen for what it is, for what it does, some benefits some usefulness and practicality in it, and so much mischief in it. Remembering what you said to me yesterday, which was critical and therefore not meeting you freshly today, because you're much more than yesterday's remarks you made. And I'm much more than yesterday's hurt I felt. include everything. You do too. We include each other. 
without becoming megalomaniacs over it because <laughs> thought doesn't need to pick it up. If thought picks it up, then watch out. Thought wants to make something out of everything. That's its duty. But can one be wise about it and aware and not take it for absolute true fact? I wanted to get to another question which came up. What, what will happen when I get back home? The insights or depths of being that have been experienced here at times, will I be able to take them home or will they be meaningful when I get back to the job, the family, the city? The incredible activity that awaits me at home, at work, and the activity all around me in the city, one person said, downtown metropolis. Challenges of the job, the overburdenness often of projects, of jobs, family, relationships, entertainment. What will happen to this precious quiet and space with its potential for insight and depth I don't know what will happen to it. I'm not worried about it right now, but I'm addressing the question. Can it remain a question? Not a throwing up the arms and hands uh, type of question, rhetorical, but really, I want to know what's going to happen as I board the plane, as I get into the car, as I drive home, as I enter the office on Monday. What will happen? What's happening? You know, the, the future is only in thought, but the present happens now, entering the computer office. Maybe 60 other computers in the office? I don't know what your office looks like. Your boss is like the people you work with, the family. What's happening? What's happening now? Can that question keep popping up so that you look and listen for a moment? Looking and listening takes no time. And what may be seen, felt, heard, and smelled is computers, busyness, ag ag agitation, or pressure. all these human motors running noisily or quietly. Find out, listen. Looking and listening can happen anytime. But the mind also can get totally absorbed anytime totally filled up with not a bit of space. So engaged in doing and projecting and wanting to do right and afraid of doing wrong. The ambitions mixed in there. Can that all, for moments at a time, be glimpsed? So that even though the mind is so busy, so filled, so unspacious, there can still be learning going on about what it is doing through these momentary glimpses, maybe they will last longer than one expected. Who knows? And maybe one will do different things with one's free time. Who knows? Maybe fill it up with more stuff. Movies, videos, music. Can there be even a spacious way of watching a movie or listening to music? Not just as a filler, as an escape, as a tranquilizer, as a distractor 
from pain or depression or loneliness. But really watch what's going on openly, not laboriously, dutifully, but curiously, wonderingly. Suddenly feeling the hands holding each other. Heart pounding, whatever's going on, the breath in and out, the fly buzzing around. Not as extraordinary events, but as something that's actually going on. So, the real question is, what's happening now? If it is what will happen in the future, then now will not be there. Except as projection of something that is imagined. right now. We will end here for today.